our speaker, Carlos Petrinacci, from the Open University, is going to give us a talk on developing the Internet of Things, opportunities and challenges. Okay, so Carlos. Hi. Um, can you hear me like this? I'll try to just keep the microphone on. Yeah. Constant high. So, um, I'm going to be uh, talking about the, uh, the Internet of Things and it's going to be, I think, the most uh, different talk to, to the previous one. The previous one was all about formal methods. This one is about the Internet of Things, which, as you will see, or you know, for those that don't know, um, it's a very scruffy world. Basically, people are just hacking things around, putting them together. That, you know, makes it uh, evolve very rapidly, but also brings a number of problems. And I'm going to be um, tackling this topic, or focusing on the topic, from obviously from the perspective of uh, the service-oriented uh, community world. And what I'm going to be trying to do is to show you um, that essentially within the Internet of Things domain, services are a very widely applied uh, abstraction uh, from a, you know the perspective of creating applications. And I will show you that essentially all the problems that have been uh, or are currently being tackled within the server of the computing world have much uh, uh, you know, applicability within this domain. In fact, I believe that in the future uh, a good deal of the you know, service oriented applications uh, will be or will have a good uh, interaction or a good part of it will be somehow Internet of Things uh, in a sense. The talk is going to be fairly high level. Um, I'm going to be tackling you know, the different uh, aspects um, and I'm going to be showing you some of the ways or means by which we are uh, addressing these problems and to which extent this is common or uh, identical to, to what's happening in the service oriented uh, world but also the novelties or the additional problems that arise from the Internet of Things per se. Um, the idea is that you go back home knowing uh, different um, places where you could work, different aspects where uh, the server of the world needs to be the pushing and also where uh, you could help uh, the internet of things uh, work. Um, it's not that you, uh, I won't be intending you to come home with a you know, clear idea how these things will be done. I will be giving pointers at topics uh, so that you can find them of interest and uh, presumably you know, lead on, do some further research or, or work on those things. Obviously, at any time, if you have a question, please do, do ask it. Just raise your voice, because that would also allow me to know which are the things that you are very much aware of and you don't want to drill down into or, or the other way around. Okay, so how, how many of you have, you heard, have heard about the Internet of Things or have a clear idea of what the Internet of Things is? Okay, so that's, that's, fairly, that's fairly good. So, in a sense, the Internet of Things is nothing but the Internet, with the difference with the difference, and this is a very important one, that uh, we now deal with zillions of devices. Actually, people are talking about billions of devices, and there are uh, estimates and numbers that I will be talking about uh, later that will give you the kind of scale uh, that we're talking about. Mobile phones, actually, uh, the ones that you have, are provided or can be used to provide data to people. So, the wireless providers probably tracking myself all here now, and knowing that we are actually here, how much data we're we using, where are we moving around. Uh, the same holds for your Bluetooth devices, this thing that I have in my hand, for example, that's also providing data, that's also interactive. Some of those have wide you know, connectivity through Wi-Fi or a uh, more localized one. But in the end, all those devices are providing uh, a certain level of communication and uh, interaction. And that allows people to develop nice applications. So, um, you know, for example, the bikes uh, that you have in several cities, the, I'm showing here a picture of London, they have, uh, they have sensors on them that could allow tracking uh, air quality, that could allow tracking uh, the traffic, where these bikes are moving and so on, where there are lots of bikes, where there aren't, uh, what kind of demands do you have, at which points of time. All this is very useful information if you want to handle your city. Same holds for, for example, uh, Nest, which is this uh, provider of uh, thermostats that, that was recently bought by Google. They have this. All these devices are now interconnected, providing a, a, a very large stream of data, and they are creating uh, nice applications. Then finally, there's, a, there's an important stream is that electronics now are fairly cheap. Uh, what I'm showing on the left there is a Raspberry Pi, which is basically for you know, 30 euros, you basically 
have a, a computer. You can run Linux on it. You can collect sensors to it. You can connect it to it. You can, you know, do serve, serve your data, uh, pass on data, track people um, through Wi-Fi and so on. So there's basically the possibility now to develop all sorts of applications with very low, uh, with very low price. And that means that there's a wide uh, deployment of, of these things out there. Um, a lot of people are talking about the scale of this thing. Um, and, you know, I'm just here putting an estimate by Cisco, but, uh, which they, they basically uh, said so. They, they say that by 2020 there will be 37 billion things connected. This means 37 billion things providing data and possibly offering new services. Providing data about where you are, but also allowing you to interact with these things. There are the same way that there's things that are sensing and collecting data, there's things that allow you to interact with them. These are the so-called actuators. So you, on the basis of what you're sensing out there, you could actually trigger uh, lowering uh, a certain barrier or putting the, you know, the, the curtains in the home or uh, changing uh, the the, uh, the the opacity of, of your windows. All these things uh, are nowadays uh, possible, and therefore these are all services in a sense. And I will show you how we actually turn them into services in the you know in the terms that we all understand in the service or in the computer world. Now, here they say 37. If you look at other estimates, they even talk about 50 billion. The key idea is that we are talking about billions. We're not talking about you know, thousands of wisdom files. We're talking about billions of things. And this is very important. So in a sense, things are like in the service-oriented computer world. But in practice, this level of scale actually changes things considerably. And this is part of what we are going to be talking about. What you really want, like I was saying, is to have a picture as neat as this one. So you have all these sensors deployed all over the world, you know, you're tracking, you're carrying them, and then you, what you want to be able is to use all this data for intelligent transportation, intelligent uh, grid management, energy management, uh, e-health, and there's indeed a lot of applications that are working in this, uh, in this area. However, the real picture is not as, uh, as plain as this one, it's more like that. What I'm showing here is a picture uh, with logos of, you know, not all, but a good deal of the players that are involved um, in this domain. The, the point here is not to show you, um, you know, for you to remember which are those, but just to, to see that there's many of them, and there's many of them focusing on very different aspects. So there's um, a lot of vendors working on the actual hardware, communication protocols and so on. There's a lot of uh, people working on uh, specific vertical domains, so for example, IP has this thing for tracking uh, your fitness, for helping you do your sport and so on, which as computer scientists uh, I recommend it. We can spend a lot of time sitting. Um, and then you, you have uh, the platform world. You have big, vend big vendors, uh, uh, big companies like IBM, Cisco, uh, Google, but also uh, a lot of uh, startups. So there's the world in the Internet of Things is buzzing, it's moving very fast, but it's moving in a very, somehow, uncontrolled, organic manner. So there's new protocols showing up every single day, new companies, new platforms, new hardware, and all of that, they can, you know, spread. There is no real standardization that allows, you know, global interconnectivity inter and interaction with these things, which is a nightmare from, a, from the perspective of creating applications. In particular, I, I just took here a, um, a document talking about the Internet of Things and, and provided some overall picture of the state and so on, uh, and I generated a tech plan out of it. Um, you see the main key uh, terms in there. Basically, if you want to deal with an Internet of Things uh, application, if you want to work on that domain, you need to deal with uh, data communication, devices, um, different kinds of technologies, um, be, you know, be very careful about the energy consumption of these devices, um, obviously, internet, security, um, processing, big data, I don't know if it's somewhere there, but loads of different topics that per se are already hard. And you need to put them all together. You need to actually create something that deals with all these things smoothly. So, the way that we're looking at this, uh, and, uh, here I'm borrowing some slides from, from a project we work on, which is called uh, but basically, that's also common to, to uh, many other approaches is, well, you have this nightmare of different uh, hardware, uh, different uh, devices with different capabilities, with different communication uh, protocols, um, and, and what you need to be able is somehow to extract away from all that. 
so that you get rid of the mess and you just view these things as you know, entities that are providing you data, that are providing you some services, some functionality that you might use, and then build applications on top of And this is essentially what we do in the service oriented computing world. So once you have abstracted them, we can be talking about or dealing with all these devices just like you know, as services. They are abstract entities that we can play with, that we can interact with, and then we can build applications. So all the typical stack and set of problems and issues of the service oriented computer world apply again in this domain. With obviously uh, you know, uh, a different degree of, of scale, a different degree of, of uh, flakiness, because these devices run on the battery and then you stop having a stream, uh, and so on. So, indeed, one of the, the first and uh, foremost problem that, that you have to deal with when you, when you have uh, to create an application is actually dealing with the heterogeneity of, of hardware. Just to give you a hint, we made a hackathon a week ago um, where people spent, you know, I don't know, it was like three days building some sort of an application. Now, interestingly, uh, we asked them to tell us how long they spent in different activities. It turned out that essentially, I don't remember the exact number, but essentially 80% of the time was uh, devoted to dealing with the hardware. So actually, grabbing the thing, connecting the wires, uh, dealing with the different libraries and protocols, uh, programming the device, sometimes it's C++ that like you use, sometimes it's uh, something uh, proprietary, um, and, and plugging this into, into something where you can then eventually work it. So it's not generating these sensors, uh, pushing these sensors data to something that you can then handle. So, you know, dealing with this thing, it, it's a bit of a nightmare, I think it's very important. And I won't be uh, dealing much with it, but basically uh, what I want to tell you is the, the essential approach that we follow is, you know, there's a lot of uh, protocols and technologies out there. Um, yeah, thank you to the Bluetooth uh, for uh, uh, ZB, SDB in some cases. Um, what well, you need to be able is to abstract it away. So what we do is basically we have a kind of uh, an abstraction layer, but what, what, what we do is essentially we proxify it. We provide whatever necessary uh, small libraries that kind of abstract us away, do the hardware specific bit, and just send this stuff to the cloud, where it all becomes, you know, HTTP, and actually web as well, because we, we need to deal with streams. But basically, once you've done this integration, that's it, you're abstracted from the world, you're dealing with abstract entities, you're dealing with services that are providing some data, have some inputs, that may have some outputs. Um, and that is a much nicer uh, world because that's you know that's what you want really to be. The place where you can start talking about the data and building your application project. So this process, as you can imagine, they're not complicated. It's just a matter of dealing with the specific tiny hardware uh, details of whatever you're dealing with. Usually the main problem is trying not to suck too much energy from the device and dealing with the low capacity, capacity of memory and these uh, things have unless you don't, that's it, you're fine you just push the data to the cloud and then application will use this and the nice thing is, by doing this abstraction you can actually not just plug devices but you can actually plug also web APIs which are nowadays uh, you know, a very important source of information in fact, if you think about any application even you know, think about transport management within the city okay, the sensors will provide you very useful data but then eventually you will also need to correlate this or to put this together with all the kinds of data that is typically offered um, through APIs, controlled by some organization, the government or, uh, organization in the case of a transport uh, system. We tell you, you know, we, where are the, the bus stop locations, where the set of things. So whenever you don't have a stream, typically uh, there is an API behind the scenes, a good API, more or less uh, scruffy, but at the end of the day, you know, an API that is providing you access to these things through HTTP. Um, and we can abstract through this simple proxy, proxy layer uh, all the data and inject it to the platform. Obviously, there has to be a, a mid, mid layer there that deals with uh, the queuing of data. Because uh, in these kind of applications, we're talking about uh, loads of devices pushing data into, into your platform. So you need to handle, handle this uh, swiftly and nicely. Okay, so once you have all these things, obviously, you know, we've, we have sucked them away. Uh, we now have, you know, these abstract entities. And it's very important that we, uh, we capture them, uh, you know, in a way that will allow us to process them, to know 
where uh, different sensor is providing, you know, where is the sensor located, and what data is it providing, um, <coughs> who is the person actually controlling this, whether it's down or not. All this kind of information is fundamental for you to actually have to screen your, your application. So a very important step is, okay, we, we, we've integrated this. Um, this device into a platform, now they're providing data, we can interact with them, but we need, we need to have good metadata about them, because otherwise you will be basically lost. Especially, you know, when you're dealing with an application that has 50 services, well, you might remember more or less all of that as just happened. But when you're dealing with sensors, uh, where there might be uh, you know, billions of them, so uh, we were saying before, you, you simply cannot just you know, afford to actually uh, uh, handle these things on a, on a graphic basis. You really need to have a good layer of metadata that would allow you to filter out you know, the sensors, the sensing devices that are uh, in certain geolocation, uh, those that are providing certain kind of data, those that are trustworthy, those that have certain properties from a security perspective. And this all relies on having a good metadata about them. The way we, uh, we are approaching this, and uh, uh, this is not just a uh, uh, need to our project, is, is essentially using uh, link data for, for this kind of metadata. How many of you are aware of uh, link data? Okay, so that's less, less of a common thing. Um, so link data essentially is it's a way to expose data in the web. So uh, uh, up until now, data on the web is essentially, well, it was essentially documents. You just put a web page that's a document that is providing certain, uh, certain information. That's all thought for human consumption. You as a human go to the web page, read what it is about, and then deal with that. Um, and obviously, we're losing lots of opportunities there. If you have this data exposed in a way that is, you know, that, is, that can be better handled by, by a machine, then you would enable uh, the machines to do the things with this data. So that you don't have to build a scraper uh, for you know, Amazon uh, uh, website to actually know which, you know, the prices of certain books and that kind of thing. These data would be exposed, should be exposed in a way that the machines can detect it and use it uh, directly. Now, link data is a way to do this. Essentially, the main idea is that you should expose not just all documents, but the pieces of data that the person was born on a certain date in a structured manner so that any, um, any machine could go and say, okay, give me information about this guy over there. What is, what is it? And, and you would obtain certain details, like for example, his date of birth or whatever. So for example, to give you a hint, there is a kind of a link data version of Wikipedia called Dbpedia that what it does is essentially it extracts uh, the structured information in, in Wikipedia pages are provided in a way that you could go and you know say, okay, give me the information that you have about Crete, and it will tell you, you know, the population uh, and so on and so forth, with which country uh, it belongs uh, to um, and, and so on. And it does so by simply using your eyes for every single thing, every single resource in there is a URI. So Crete would have a URI uh, that you can actually do a get, you know, with your web browser, you just do a get of this, and what you would get, obtain, uh, when you do this, is a piece of structured description that is telling you what this thing is about. And another important aspect of the data is tracking, keeping links to things. Now, if you have your data in a silo, data is valuable for sure. But if it's in a silo, it's much less valuable than if it is interlinked. That if you say, well, you know, uh, this web page in, in Wikimedia is about red hot chili peppers and actually if you go to this other website you have a lot more information about red hot chili peppers and actually it turns out that you know, this person there uh, likes red hot chili peppers so you can navigate a graph of data and that allows you to do much more complex applications than what you would be able to do just with silos so that's essentially what link data is about you have a set of technologies like the RDF uh, for representing the data and uh, Sparkle to, to allow you to query this data um, it would be like an SQL but for RDF in SES, uh, just so that you can understand each other um, but that allows you to create a web of data where you're not, you're not just dealing with documents you're dealing with uh, tiny pieces of data about things so how does this apply to our domain? well, um, we were talking about having metadata about these services having metadata about the sensors what they provide, where they're located and so on the way we track this um, 
is through uh, using big data. Basically, we capture all these description in a structured manner, even on the FMBase, post them and on the web. And why is this important? It's important because when some new uh, application developer comes and wants to be able to use your sensor, the sensor that you deployed, say, five years ago for a certain scenario, um, he will just be able to say, okay, give me all the sensors that are in this area. You will get certain URIs, certain you know, pointers to, to the sensors, and you will just be able to say, hey, what is the sensor about? You do an HTTP get on this, and you get a description, and you can work with this straight away. So that's the whole approach that, that we uh, follow for capturing this, this metadata about the things, about the services, uh, in a way that machines can actually uh, go to it, uh, understand them, and use them. We have uh, machine learning behind the scenes for, for tracking this, which is called a server, and I'll be covering this in more detail afterwards. Um, <coughs> some of the things that we also have to deal with, uh, and that applies also to both to sensors and to, uh, and to web APIs, is that, like, like I said, you, uh, many of us have to deal with uh, the scruffing uh, well, of the internet of things, where you know, hardly you don't have a uh, you know, standardized way for accessing things and so on. The same way you don't have a standardized way for accessing web APIs nowadays. I'm showing there an example of, of LastFM, which is an API for obtaining uh, information about music uh, and so on. Uh, if you want to be able to, to use these things, uh, you obviously need to have this metadata. You need to know where they are, you need to know what they do. And the problem in this world uh, is that as opposed to what happened, uh, or what was assumed in, in terms of the computing from the beginning, which was, hey, there's a whistle out there that is telling you there's an endpoint here, these are the inputs, message parts, and so on. In, the, in this world, you don't have that. You are, in the best case, left with that page on the right, uh, right hand side for you guys. <coughs> which is basically telling you in textual, uh, in the textual description, just plain text, what uh, this API is about. Now, um, we've been doing work, and, and this is actually an ongoing research uh, because it's particularly challenging, on actually spotting APIs out there. Which are the APIs that are out there? There's obviously, um, you know, attempts uh, to structure, to provide structured descriptions for APIs, um, and the, the same outputs for, for sensors. But the, the, the reality is that, you know, there's no established standard, so basically do, people do whatever they feel like doing. Essentially, in this domain, people are tend to be other hackers. So you hack something, something that works, and that's it. Are you don't worry about the rest of them? Now, the rest is the guy that wants to use this thing, then it's invested in it, it with, uh, with good trouble. So what we've been doing for, for trying to uh, you know, find these APIs and, uh, and obtain structured descriptions is actually approach as a problem of identifying documentation, because there's no way to actually spot that there's an API sitting at some end point. Because it's always the P you don't know what you get. <coughs> so the way we're approaching the finding these APIs out there is actually through this question that I'm showing you here. So say that you go, you find a web page, you're given an HTML. The question that you need to answer is, is this documented in web API? Yes or no? And obviously if you look at both examples, it might seem trivial to actually spot that you know the, the BBC web page is actually not there. Uh, but actually, if you try to compute this automatically, it's not so, it's not so easy. Um, the way we've been tackling this is essentially using uh, natural language processing techniques and machine learning. I'm not going to be dealing too much into the details of that, but the, uh, the, the essence of, of what we've been doing is looking at to, uh, into pre-processing the, the HTML within the web pages, getting rid of the, you know, the JavaScript and all of the rubbish that we don't want to. Just look at the text. Do analysis of that to actually you know, detect certain pieces of, uh, of information out of that, analyzing the URLs, analyzing the, the title, and then also processing the text, essentially you know, getting rid of, of certain words, stop words, and, and trying to calculate the, uh, the weight of those words across web pages. Um, and what we do is, okay, we uh, pre selected, uh, I think it was a couple of thousand web pages. That we manually annotate. We manually say, okay, this is documented over again, this is not documented over again. And we use this as a training set. We basically train our classifiers 
to actually be able to, to, to see if we could be able to figure out, given a web page and given the previous examples that we know uh, where, uh, where web APIs or not, well, descriptions of web APIs or not, whether we could actually automatically guess it. And uh, what you show on the right hand side with the results of what we were developing, we used uh, different uh, tooling for that, Weka for, for, for the uh, kind of in house machine learning algorithms and mount for, for the larger scale kind of uh, version of those. And we actually show, uh, managed to, to, to obtain even you know, with our own um, algorithm 82% accuracy. What this means is that essentially in 82% of the cases when you're giving our machine a web page, it's able to tell you correctly whether it is documented or whether you or not. So that allows us to say, okay, now we can go, crawl the web, get all the web pages in the, in the web. And there's actually existing uh, crawls, uh, public crawls for that. And actually figure out which are the web APIs are there. And the same actually holds for, for, for the sensors. Then obviously once we found the web page, um, that's not enough. It's, it's good. We have a web API and we can actually you know, abstract certain details about this, like for example the domain, because we know the terms that are used and so on. But what you really want is to get a structured description out of them. Um, and this again is, is, a, is very challenging because people don't use it the same way for describing uh, these web APIs. You saw me previously the web page in, in red uh, from last affair. It has nothing to do with format or in type of information provided uh, with this one, which is the one from uh, Twitter. And you have to deal with this. So again, we worked on, on trying to figure out how we can extract information out of those. Can we spot the methods? Can we spot the, uh, the, the resources that are there? Can we spot the actual endpoints? And obviously, on the basis of this, we would have a good, uh, solid uh, basis for, for uh, obtaining these descriptions. It turns out that um, this, is, uh, this is a harder problem than the previous one, um, but it's actually also viable. We can get fairly good accuracy uh, at uh, processing these things. What we essentially do, just to give you a hint, is we first look at the web page and get rid of the side things. You know, we try and get rid of the banner, and footer, you know, the, the kind of navigation things, and we can do this on the basis of the entropy of the information. So we, we uh, look at the information in there and we see how different it is, how, how noisy it is, and if you know there's lots of data in it uh, that is not uh, kind of regular, then this tends to be the content that you're interested in. Once you do that, then you look into uh, detecting patterns. And what we're doing that is essentially you look at patterns within the HTML, you know, look into the document in the HTML web page, trying to detect patterns of repetition. What happens when you have an API is that you basically are documenting the methods. So you would have a set of methods, five methods. And if you're not a bit weird, you tend to use the same format for all these methods, yeah? So you structure it the same way. So this is the resources, you can see it in there. Uh, you have uh, here at the top, uh, you know, the actual HTTP method to be used, the, uh, the uh, part of the, the endpoint, basically the, the resource it refers to, and some textual description about it. Now these patterns are repeated across all of them, and we can exploit that. Um, so doing this kind of text processing, we are able to extract, again, uh, uh, descriptions of the structured uh, nature of these web APIs, and that leads us to to much better kind of metadata about this, the APIs that you can use um, <coughs> within your applications. Um, although I cannot drill down into the details of the whole thing, in, in reality we apply different techniques for REST, uh, for RESTful services, um, well, for resource oriented services, and for RPC uh, oriented services. It turns out that even, even though web APIs are so-called so RESTful services, how many people actually follow REST principles? What they do is essentially some sort of uh, mixture of it. So in some cases, like this one, it, it's sort of uh, resource oriented, but in many cases, actually, they are more RPC like. And for that, there is a very nice and simple heuristic to spot methods, which is uh, looking for common case words uh, that have something like a verb and a noun. Get account, uh, create uh, transaction, whatever. It's very simple. You, you apply this. Uh, uh, NLP techniques, and you get a very, very high accuracy with RPC uh, systems. Anyway, so once we have we have all these descriptions, we, we can deal with them. Uh, we, we know where the services, the sensors, and so on are, 
Uh, what happens is that in those kind of applications, you would have all these systems pushing data. So imagine that we are tracking now the location of all of us here in the room. There is, I don't know how many of, of us here, but each and um, every one of us should, would be pushing a stream of data. And you need a certain kind of, you know, fine grain push of these data so that you can actually keep track of all the people. And if you only set this data every minute, then you will only know where this person is every minute. And you don't want this. The result is that you have, typically in these kind of applications, uh, based on the you know, Internet of Things, an overwhelming uh, flow of data through streams that sometimes and very typically need to be combined with more static data. Like I was saying previously, in the transport system, you want to know the bus stops, but also you want to be able to track the demand, where people are moving, where people are located, so that you actually know whether you, know, you should be sending more buses uh, in one direction or not. This leads obviously to uh, all the typical problems uh, with data processing uh, at scale. And I understand that uh, tomorrow there's going to be a talk on, on big data, but uh, this is very important. So, like I said before, if you want to create an uh, Internet of Things application, eventually you will have to deal with a large quantity of data, and this is not trivial. So again, uh, what, we, what we're doing in this area is actually looking at uh, what the big data uh, community are working on. And essentially, um, up until now, most of the work was approached as uh, MapReduce. Basically, uh, who is aware of MapReduce? Okay. So MapReduce is, is actually it's, it's an algorithm for massive parallelization of computation. All the computation is exposed or defined in terms of map activities that basically map pieces of data to the function and reduce activities that put them back together. The idea essentially is that through this reduction of a program into map reduce steps, you can actually distribute this through loads of, uh, of computers, compute it very much, much faster than you would do it as a situation. And that wouldn't lead to any race issues. We just uh, eventually put them together. Now, map reduce. It's very nice, but it, it works in batch. So basically, you take your data and say, hey, you know, run this thing. This is, you know, that all started with Google trying to compute the page rank algorithm for the web pages. That is what is giving you the popularity of a web page or another. Um, but obviously, in this case that I was saying, some of the data will be static. For example, things that you've been, data that you've been collecting about people moving around. Where do they tend to be? Where do they tend to go? But some other is actually dynamic. You need to be able to react to where people are at the moment and be very important in terms of action. You need to be able to spot that, for example, one sensor is not providing uh, data at the moment and that might have an impact on your system. So you need to combine the, let's say, map reduce world with the stream processing world. That's at least the, the way uh, in the big data community, uh, uh, you know, processing large quantities of streams of data is approached. And the techniques for each of them are, are quite different. Now, what we're working on, basically the, the approach that tends to be followed by the, by the community in those kind of scenarios where you have both batch, basically static data and real time data you have to deal with, is uh, the so called lambda architecture, which is what you are representing there. So basically, you have at the entry point the new data, typically queued in a system. In our case, we use a test thread, but you, know, you can use many others. Um, and whenever the data is coming in, some of it, typically you're logging it, you keep in track of it for batch time computation, like historical events and so on. Um, but then there's the other one where we have the real-time view. And the real-time view is the one that is actually going to be every single piece of data is going to come through the pipe and it will be transformed, it will be processed, and something will come out. Some of the stuff that comes out would likely uh, end up in the, in the batch layer, in the, in the basically historical data, but not some of it will actually be pushed directly out to the, uh, to the client and the applications. So what we're doing in there is, um, so for stream processing we're using Apache Storm, basically there was a system developed by Twitter uh, to process the, the Twitch streams, and we're using it there, it's the same way. We're piping through the data generated by the sensors, actually in JSON, and we might be through uh, Apache Storm topologies. Basically, these topologies, what they say is you have this notion of uh, uh, spouts and bolts, basically things that uh, suck in data and things that generate some data, and you just create a topology, basically how this thing is going through the channel. So 
every time you have an event, you might compare it with a certain value, and if it's a certain value, you, you then do something, and so on. The notion of loop, typical of uh, business process uh, languages, like people, and so on, is actually implicit in these, uh, in these systems. Because basically, you're going to be running the topology for every single piece of data that you get. Okay? Um, then obviously, for the massive data, you need to have, you need to have um, you know, machine reader is able to scale, um, and is able, to, especially, to ingest data at very high speeds. For these reasons, we've fallen down to, let's say, more uh, uh, modern kind of uh, database technologies, no secure activities in particular, uh, not no secure solutions in particular, we're using Couchbase for, uh, for our domain, which is basically a, a document store uh, where every single document is adjacable. And then uh, we just are able to do very big updates, able to handle this, and we are also able to you know, scale it up at the back end by adding more machines to the, to the Couchbase infrastructure. Um, you may wonder why we use JSON as the main common uh, language for that. The main reason is that most of these sensors and APIs, they are actually pushing up JSON. It's somehow becoming a bit of a de facto standard for the data representation for this thing. You may like, like it uh, more or less, but at the end of the day, it's fairly, fairly clean, not very heavyweight, and it allows you to uh, basically having JSON as a native kind of data representation of this layer, it allows you to deal to, to sort out a lot of data integration issues uh, at the later stage. Um, obviously, you have a link um, down there to the platform that has all these integrated. It's actually available online. You could even register if I turn on if they show you some demo, but you could even register yourself, your, your mobile phone, move it, and you know, start collecting data about it and, and, and so on. Um, and there's more details on the, on the actual technology. Just want to give you some hints about the, the things. Um, now, one fundamental step that you, you know is uh, needs to take place uh, in, when you're building an application, uh, especially when you view it as a service or an application, is you know, the discovery. So sometimes you know very very much what you want to use, but some of the times you you know what you want to use, but you don't know where it is. You don't know whether it exists. You basically know that you want sensors that will provide you location about people in a certain area, but you don't know where they are, and whether they're the same actually. Um, so for this, you need to do discovery. And um, obviously, you know, discovery has been a common topic in the, in the search of the computer world. But here we're dealing with a very different kind of, well, different in, in terms of scale. Let's remember that we're talking about billions of, of those devices. So you basically need to look into um, discovery techniques that, although powerful, that will allow you to to actually do, do discovery at large scale, fast. So part of the discovery is what I was covering before, of the, the actual acquisition and generation of metadata. Um, but the other things that we, that we do is um, we have basically a uh, machinery called ISER that, um, that takes care of this. It, in a sense, it's the old kind of uh, service registry with the difference that is based on the data. Everything in there is represented as an RDF. Every single service is an RDF graph, actually. We know that there's a service that has certain properties, that has certain inputs, certain outputs, that may have some preconditions, that may have some effects. And this is all captured uh, in RDF. Now, it's, it's captured in RDF, and it can actually uh, have semantic annotations. So you can actually attach to it that you know, this service actually the future says. And because of that, you, you, you can already disregard certain actions with it. You know, you can attach to it a certain kind of uh, annotation regarding, for example, the, the quality of, of service they, they provide. Basically. To which extent is this sensor designed? Is it providing uh, updates regularly? That's it. Is it faulty? In the internet of things, this is a very typical thing. You run on a battery, that's it. This stream doesn't appear anymore. So it's good to know and keep track of these things. And we, uh, we provide the means for, for tracking these things in that, uh, in that infrastructure. Um, you know, some of it is actually the typical stuff for dealing with uh, the same uh, old style of services, so there's support in there for you know, things like, uh, like uh, SA Visible, uh, which is the semantic annotation of Visible, uh, also for RLS and, and so on. But there's also, um, on top, the important bit that, that I wanted to, to cover is actually the, the, the discovery bit uh, 
at the top. What we are applying is state-of-the-art uh, semantic discovery techniques, basically that provide us support to, to discovery based on function classifications. So what kind of service is this? Uh, discovery based on inputs and outputs. So which are the services that could consume this kind of data, which are the services that could produce this kind of data, a typical uh, situation that we might have in an application. And we can combine them. Obviously, we have also geolocation, geofencing based uh, uh, filters for, for you know, running discovery queries over certain, certain specific geographical uh, locations and anything into that. Um, the important work that, that needs to be done in this, uh, in this area that we uh, know was the, the main focus of, uh, of our, uh, let's say, development to deal with internet things was actually regarding the scale. And I will show you a very simple detail afterwards when we, when we deal about composition that will actually make you clear what I'm talking about and not why uh, dealing with uh, scale is that important and the impact you might have. Okay, so the next thing that you want to do typically is compose, create an application. Again, bear in mind the large scale heterogeneity. And there is a very important aspect in here which is uh, regarding the scale, which is the fact that it has to be tightly integrated with discovery. What do I mean by that? If you look at all the work in um, composition, typically what is assumed is that the composition engine knows, has in memory every all of the descriptions of the services. It knows what services are in there. Now, can we assume that every single uh, the, the composition engine that we're going to be using in our application or in our development framework knows about the 37 million services? We cannot. So basically, you need to be able to run composition over distributed discovery registries. And why is this such a has this such an important uh, factor? Well, we tried to run this over you know normal things, and if you actually use the same kind of API that discovery engines provide, the performance that you get is really really nasty. Um, the blue line in there. Is actually showing um, the, the performance that we were obtaining by running queries over discovery engine, which is one, having up to 8,000 services. So, not so many, talking okay, big ones, 8,000 services. Um, and the actual the, the result was that because we, the kind of API was really uh, thought for very granular uh, invocations. Uh, common, very quick you know, interactions for, for uh, dealing with, for example, problems like composition, that you were, dealing, you were leading to uh, response times of more than a thousand seconds when you wanted to calculate all the possible compositions for a registry with 8,000 cells. Obviously, as you can imagine, this is not actually viable uh, in, in, in a real setting when we're talking about billions. So let me just uh, let you know a bit how we are them. So because because the Internet of Things is, is rather scruffy, developers tend to be tend to go essentially data driven. So we uh, we looked at the problem of service composition from a very much data flow centric perspective. So a data driven composition we, we like to call it. Basically the idea is that you you probably know you know in your problem that you what data you have available. These are the pieces of data that I have available. And you want to know, you want to know um, how to actually generate some noise and data. So I have these streams of information, tracking devices, and so on, and I want to be able to estimate the traffic. Is there any possible composition of services that you know of that could allow me to produce that? It's the kind of question that you want to ask. Basically just data. We're forgetting about prepetition and effects because actually already dealing with data uh, at this level of scale that's already complex enough. So the way we are approaching this is indeed we need to have access to the to the to the services, we need to know which ones could be composed and how. But we do not have access to all the data. Like I said, you cannot have only said 37 billion in each and every one of the local composition engines that applications may have. So what you do is you have to you have to transform the actual you have to first of all create a search space which is a subset of all the potential relevant, potentially relevant services out there. And how do you do this? Well discovery entries are for that. 
So what you have to do is run a bunch of discovery queries telling the, telling the different discovery engines that you might be interested in um, which services could be relevant for you. How do we do this? Simply on the basis of input and output discovery. So these are the inputs that I have available. Which services are able to produce something that are able to ingest this kind of input? And you run discovery queries to them, and then you get that from, you get those services. And you move on. Now this is my pool of services. So these are all the pieces of data that, are, that I have available, which is the original problem specification plus all the data that could be generated by the services that could be involved with the previous available. And you move on, and so on and so forth. Until you cannot, you do not get any more services. This builds you the search space. And actually it allows you to basically generate what we call the composition graph, which is a subset of basically a graph which moves you from the initial state, which is where you have all your inputs, to all the possible outputs that you can generate. And what we do after the later stages, we optimize it. We, we get rid of some of, uh, of, of those services that are not relevant because you know, they provide the data that are interesting to us. And we end up with an optimized graph, uh, you know, which is a, a very a much smaller subset of all the possible services that exist in the world, that we have in memory, and that we can actually do you know, search for. And what we essentially do is simply, okay, so we know what piece of data we have at the beginning, we search for paths within the graph. So we generate this composition graph, which are all the possible chains of invocations of services, and we search through this graph. So that starting from the beginning, we end up at the end state, which is we obtain all the outputs that we wanted. Now, the graphs that you saw before, uh, this, is, this is done actually by, by the composition engine that is open source, uh, it's available online. Um, and it is tightly integrated with, with ISF. And the, the work that was done is trying to refine both the indexing machinery and the API of the discovery engine such that this kind of composition could be done against distributed registries. So against registries that are not, you know, are in a separate box from that holding the composition engine or in a fast manner. And those are the graphs that, that, that we run. So, uh, the top blue line was out of the box just running queries for every single one of those we run a query that actually discovered the services based on the input and outputs. And that was leading to composition times in, in register with 8,000 of 1,000 seconds. That's not viable. So we looked into indexing mechanisms. And we said, okay, why don't we uh, index the actual inputs and outputs of each of these, uh, these services so that we can find them faster. That led us to, to the, the red line, which is much better. It's, well, as you can see, it's a logarithmic scale. So, uh, you know, we moved from more than 1,000 seconds to uh, 90 seconds, I believe. But that was obviously not enough. 90 seconds is still one minute and a half for actually 8,000 services. So we looked into actually indexing everything. So we indexed both the uh, domain models, basically the subsumption hierarchy of different domains, so what kind of data this is, and uh, whether there's um, more refined, more general data that could be compatible with the data provided by service, as well as the inputs and outputs, and that led us to the green line, which is in, in the range of hardly just a bit more uh, of one second for this kind of domain, so uh, uh, considerable improvement in performance. Um, the the takeaway message in this regard is that First, we have to forget the notion of composition in memory, knowing everything about the world. That's not viable. This means we have to do composition against discovery engines, and that means discovery engines need to be adapted. Because they are typically thought of, you know, you just go there, click once, and then you can wait as long as you want. No, you need response time in the of very few milliseconds if you want to be able to do composition at scale. Finally, Execution, um, how late am I? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, um, yeah. Well, finally, execution. So obviously, once you've created an, an application, you want, to, you want to be able to, to execute it. Um, in there, like I said, a big deal of the, of the work is actually done by this data processing infrastructure that, we, that I was showing in the beginning, this string processing plus batch uh, processing infrastructure. Um, and for the batch processing infrastructure, what you essentially do is just you just create and reduce uh, programs, and there is uh, there are DSLs for that. There are high-level specification languages that you can use to actually create create an application. Uh, 
basically create the bank reduce program and that could be submitted to the uh, infrastructure and they just be running there. For the stream, we've looked into, into uh, providing means for people to define their stream, the, the kind of stream processing they want to apply for the application through a nice graphical user interface and be able to compile this down to something that could be executed on a store, a stream processing engine. Now, I was telling you before that um, Storm uses this notion of the topology, which is a set of uh, outs and bonds, basically sucking data and, and, and generating some of the data. So you chain it actually. Every piece of data is piped through this uh, uh, topology. The issue with uh, these systems is that uh, what they do is they do some fancy compilation, let's say, uh, when you actually create a program. You create a new specification of what you want to do with the data, and that generates a topology. That generates a topology each and every time. So why is this important? Well, if you, if this is your scenario, like you know, you're you are providing all the you know, big data uh, infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, where people can go develop their applications, deploy them, and so on. Uh, if every single time someone deploys an application, you have to recompute the whole topology, then you're basically breaking your application every, every now and then. You're breaking everybody's applications, actually, every time. So we, we, we've been looking into ways to avoid that. And the way that we've done it is we've created a generic topology that could be applied across domains. And what we do is basically just compile down the specifications down to a to generic topology. Essentially, the topology does <coughs> That is the data, may come from directly from the stream or from additional sources. Um, does some uh, prefiltering, perform the, the key transformations over those, and then do some of filtering. Then we store it and we emit uh, any, anything that has to be emitted. So this is a generic topology that is being used, and we're currently testing it with respect to performance and with respect to also the generation, how, how well can it be applied across the data so far. So now, we know obviously we have the user interface and you will see the typical, the typical kind of uh, uh, flow rate that, that approaches. Here, we're following uh, uh, roughly the same kind of approaches that are used in the service oriented world, but slightly different. So, we're using essentially an event based uh, language, which is mostly or essentially concerned with the, with the data flow. You can inject some control flow in there through functions, but it's essentially very data centric. And the reason for this is that this is what the Internet of Things guys use. They're not so much concerned with having a, a you know, complex VPN uh, process that you can then you know, execute. They're actually more concerned with uh, getting this stream of data, I'm doing, you know, I'm collecting data from Twitter and then I'm doing sentiment analysis over it and then I'm triggering something. And so that kind of thing, all very much event based. Um, we use it for this Nordred. So Nordred is an open source uh, software originally uh, pushed out by IBM and we are contributing to it. It's all based on Node.js and, and the nice thing is, again, JSON is kind of native to the platform so that's very handy for us, but it's also very common and very much uh, friendly to, to the Internet of Things. Uh, and there's a kind of a, a good community behind it, so I really want to, to play with this. Um, so, Finally, the, the, the thing that I know least about, but there's, ah, yeah. well, there was a security expert in the room um, from the project, but as you can imagine, I will, I've been mentioning, and that would be the last thing, I've been mentioning a, a lot of you know, scenarios and like tracking people and so on, and obviously it should have come to your mind, security privacy and essential issues. In fact, in this domain, it's, it's fundamental. We, we have to deal with uh, ethical issues all the time, and we have. We have to have uh, people controlling the data. Uh, we have a very uh, controlled procedure on how you handle this data. This is all, you know, it have, all needs to be instrumental with the EDO platform. And to do this, basically, what we are uh, looking into is, is techniques, and you know, we'll actually talk a little bit with me, but basically, we are looking into performing static analysis over software that is, the, that is defined, you know, the actual computation that we define. defined. We're looking into the descriptions of the different services and things that are involved, which may have certain security uh, properties, so it doesn't use for communication necessarily, but, uh, that kind of thing. <coughs> and we are at every single point in time tracking what's happening with the data. So when you send it through the pipeline, I wasn't you know, dealing much with this, but you, you might have seen the pipeline at the bottom, logging. 
Because every single activity that is done on some data, we're tracking it. Because this allows you to know where the data came from and therefore through, through which channels it went through and how uh, trustworthy it is. And that allows you also to, uh, to assess uh, further control over, over the applications. What we're looking into in, in this domain is obviously using all that to analyze the applications and tell people, look, if you run this thing, that won't be secure. This service is not good enough. And we're basically uh, still working progress, obviously, but we're basically uh, trying to you know, spot in the, in the graph, whatever the, in the workflow, the pieces that are actually weak, the weak links, those that do not, do not hold, basically, what the preconditions and, and effects are over the data doesn't hold. Um, that's pretty much obviously for privacy, there's also uh, other kind of range of issues here, for example, how much of data is exposed, that's a, that's a fundamental issue, so um, just to give you a hint, uh, in the project uh, working with uh, data about the credit cards from the bank, um, you know, they basically keep every transaction from the credit cards from the data certain issues, you know, every one of these devices will go and put this thing. And the, the problem is that, you know, it's most, in the small streets, if you provide all the data for all the shops, it's small streets where there's only two shops, for example, you can't pinpoint what the actual income of this uh, shop is. And then, uh, these are things that you, know, you should allow. It's even more, it's even trickier when, it, when it's about, you know, devices tracking the health uh, of a person and so on and so forth. So we're looking into anonymization, but also, uh, you know, issues of grand and the data, because you can, you can take a mind data and extract features that in principle you have exposed. This is essentially, I would say that this is perhaps the trickiest and most important uh, uh, of the problems in this domain. Uh, so if you guys are looking for one domain where you know there's a lot of challenges and, and uh, massive impact, I would say this is this is the one. There's a lot of uh, further challenges from less computing pushing computation down to the devices to adaptation dealing with development and evolution and like I said the most important bit is what's what we lost people. End of the day, all these things are tracking us and we're providing lots of information about us. We all we are usually most concerned about doing computer things, but there's very important implications that we have to take So thank you very much. something that is telling you concerts in 
the city for that, okay? Um, so the impression is get concerts and one of the parameters is a city. Now you, you know, you can look at a city and figure out, well, maybe this is a city. Um, but then you still need to be, need to be sure, right? You have an example that says, you know, blah, blah, and location with Madrid. And you're like, okay. So let's, let's see if that actually is the way it works. So what you go is you go to the cloud, and this, again, big data is, is very handy, very handy for that. Is actually, you look for, okay, tell me a few cities. And you get Paris, Iraq, and so on. And you hit the API several times with all those cities. And then you figure out whether you get results or not. And if you get results, then actually it turns out that it's a city and you know how to import it. So that's, that's the way it's done. Now, it, again, it won't, deal, it won't lead you to a, a, a perfectly clean uh, description, but the idea here is actually to be able to discover them and then to actually uh, uh, to shorten the, reaching the gap between you know, it being discovered and, and having a, a you know, usable description. Eventually, the one that wants to use it might have to tweak its description to provide some further details, but it starts already from a fairly well uh, uh, described uh, uh, kind of template, and additionally, is able to actually find it, because we already knew that there was a service that provides event details, because we know it from the description, from the general text. Otherwise, we'll be able to you know, go to Google, do everything, spend half a day just finding things, and see what Okay, so uh, let's take again the speaker and uh, we have.